Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another lecture in Geography 341, Weather and Society. Dr. Zach Hilgendorf. Uh, it's been a few weeks since recording, so uh, I think I'm recording this just prior to week four. I'm going to be recording a handful of lectures here, so if it looks like I never change my shirt, that's kind of your reason. Um, so today is uh, the start of kind of a shift, or in some ways, we've been talking about energy, we've been talking about how to interpret uh, weather symbols, things like that over the last few weeks. Um, we've been talking about temperature and heat. Today, we're going to be talking about water uh, in this series of lectures, the next, I think it's five or six short lectures. We're going to be talking about water, humidity, and air parcels or air masses and how they move about the planet. And this is really the start of kind of our really considering and thinking about interpretive weather. We have to understand how these parcels work and how they function, how they move, how humidity works, what it means, how water as an element, as a molecule on our planet, uh, is functioning. So we are going to be going and talking in this first one about the properties of water. Um, what makes water so special? Because it, it's covering a majority of our earth. Um, it's in us pretty extensively. It's it's all around us. It's in the air we breathe. It's in you know how we wash our dishes. So water is a pretty unique molecule here on our planet. So we're going to start by talking kind of about the unique physical properties of water. And disclaimer, if you've been in Geography 104, Geography 340, Climatology, or Geography 364, Pluvial, it's very likely that you've seen a slide or two from here, so just bear with me. Um, it's a good review or new content if you uh, haven't been in any of those classes or you haven't been in them as I have taught them. So first off, you ask the question, water, <laughs> um, what is it? it, it it seems like second nature. I mean, I'm sitting here recording with a glass of water uh, right next to me, right? And here we're looking at water in its liquid form. I'm gonna take a sip now. Well, oh, it's a chemical compound. Uh, it is dipolar, which means that each atom has a dipole or a partial charge. We are looking at H2O, dihydrogen monoxide, two hydrogen atoms bonded with an oxygen atom. And we can see here, we're looking at a weak positive uh, polarity here in kind of our little molecule diagram here. If we look in the bottom uh, to the left of me, that's a three-dimensional model of what a water molecule looks like. Or to the right, to the right, that way, <laughs> um, a structural formula of, of a water molecule. So made up of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. There's a polar covalent bond between atoms. These are very stable. Difficult to break uh, the polar covalent bond between water and hydrogen. Between molecules, so one water molecule to the other water molecule, there's a hydrogen bond between those two different molecules. And as a good friend and colleague of mine, Dr. Gary Running, uh, used to show in his Geography 104 lectures, it kind of looks like an upside down Mickey Mouse hat. So. <laughs> Uh, continuing on some of these unique physical properties. So hydrogen bonding leads to what we call cohesion. That's basically just the attraction of molecules for other molecules of the same kind. That's why, you know, water molecules, you'll see if you have two drops that are really close together, they'll bead, right? And they kind of form together as they, as they move about a surface. That's why you can slightly overfill a glass and you get that kind of little bubble over top of the rim. That's what we call surface tension. So Water is very good at sticking to itself. And because of that, you can have that little bit of surface tension uh, over the top of glass. It's also why things like mosquitoes or pond striders can ride atop and sit atop water on a pond as they have that surface tension that's created by these cohesive bonds. Water molecules also attract to other molecules through the process of adhesion. This is basically just the attraction of molecules to those of another kind. And that's all really important because both of these forces relate to what we call capillary forces. And that forces water to move upwards against gravity as they stick to other molecules. Water sticks to itself, water sticks to other things. It's very important because this is kind of what helps water move throughout things like soil, trees, and plants. These processes lead to evapotranspiration, which we'll talk about briefly at the end of this video. Kind of all of the different things that help water move and cycle throughout our planet and make it available to our atmosphere with which to condense and precipitate out in the forms of rain, snow, hail, sleet, etc. 
Water is common in all three phases of matter, gas, liquid, and solid. We're seeing it here in this uh, image of the Great Lakes. So obviously liquid water, uh, let me see, grab my little pen here. Got some liquid water exposed right here. We've got solid water in the form of snow and ice over here. And we're seeing these, this streeting, so we call uh, these clouds, the gas, gaseous form of water right there. There is a latent heat exchange with phase changes. And what that just means is that heat is absorbed or released as water changes state. And with heat, we have energy exchange as water is absorbed or as heat is absorbed or released. So that's really what we're seeing is just how a molecule of water is exchanging energy as it goes from state to state to state. So if we look here. So that water phase is determined by the degree of hydrogen bonding. So in its gaseous form, we're looking at individual molecules moving about very rapidly uh, at a much faster or faster um, potential than you would have in things like liquid water, which is not moving as rapidly. That is what we call clusters of molecules. And then ice or solid water is just a rigid framework of molecules. That's how we see these beautiful figures like snowflakes, for example. That's because of this rigid latticework and framework of molecules that we see. If we look at phase changes of water, if we are going from a solid to a liquid or solid to a gas, we are breaking those hydrogen bonds in the forms of sublimation, melting, or vaporization or evaporation. Water molecules absorb energy. We have a cooling process. As we form hydrogen bonds through the processes of deposition, condensation, and freezing, water molecules are releasing energy. They're, these are what we have as warming processes. Now, the next important thing to note is that water has a high specific heat. Now, when we're talking about specific heat, we basically just mean how much does it take to raise one gram of a material one degree Celsius. So if you were to look at water, compared to, for example, the land or a land mass, it's going to take a lot more heat to heat up one gram of water than it is one gram of land. Now, why is that? Well, there's a few different reasons. One, water is transparent or semi-transparent, right? So that insulation, that incoming solar radiation that we see here is penetrating deeper into this water column. And as it does so, it's leading to this kind of mixing of water because hot air rises, hot water rises, cold water descends, right? So you're getting this mixing of water because of these differences in thermal gradients. So because of that, it takes a lot more energy to heat up water the same way it does land. Land will heat up much more rapidly, cool down much more rapidly. This leads to what we call continentality and the maritime effect. Temperature conditions are more extreme over land, as land warms and cools more rapidly. Temperature conditions are more moderate over bodies or near bodies of water. That's why coastal zones are typically so moderately cli or moderate climated, climated, climated <laughs> have such moderate climates, pardon me. Um, because if you look at areas like coastal California, the, very temperate, we call it Mediterranean style climate. It never gets really cold. It often doesn't get very hot. It's just kind of that nice 70 degrees or so all the time. It's because you have this massive moderating body of water, the Pacific Ocean, right there. Even here in Wisconsin and in the Lake or Great Lakes region, we can see that as well. If you're around Lake Superior or Lake Michigan or Erie, Huron, Ontario, your temperatures are going to be a lot more moderate right next to the lake than even just a number of miles inland. So we'll talk more about kind of how that impacts the exchange of moisture and energy when we're kind of talking about, you know, these different patterns of weather that we would see in, for example, a coastal zone versus a tri or interior continental zone. But for now, just note that water has a high specific heat. So it takes a lot longer for water to heat up, but 
it takes longer for it to cool down as well. That's how that moderation occurs. Now, not as pertinent to consider, given that we're in a meteorology and weather class, water is a universal solvent. It's great at dissolving things. And it's a chemical catalyst, which means it's good at accelerating chemical reactions. That's how we break down materials on the earth so much more efficiently. If we were to look at this fresh gargoyle or chimera or whatever you want to call it here, we see it looking nice, pristine, all these sharp edges. But if we were to look at it maybe a few years later, it would look something like this. Notice how dissolved this material is, how you kind of lose all definition and features. So water is great at dissolving things. Um, because of all of these properties, we can see that water is essential to life as we know it on the planet. That's how plants exist. That's how we exist. So water and understanding how water functions is incredibly important. Now, based off of all of these principles, water is the most effective thing at shaping our planet. A lot of times, thanks to our weather patterns and how our weather functions on the surface. We're looking at uh, a pretty big uh, dam failure here. Uh, you see a lot of, I think this is the maybe the Oroville Dam. Um, we can see seepage over there. We can see this is our, our little spillway right here. And it's water is not going where it's supposed to, as it often doesn't. So even in the driest climates, water is an effective at uh, creating and altering the landscape. This landscape here was formed by things like snow melt in the high Colorado Rockies area. This is, we're looking at the Colorado River, uh, and this is just upstream a little bit from uh, the one of the most fascinating and famous places in the world, Grand Canyon. Um, water formed this, and running water, flowing water, and that flowing water came from uh, meteorological processes of rain and snow further up the drainage uh, and water flowing through this region here. So if we were to look here at our big blue marble uh, we call Earth, we can see that there are 1.4 billion cubic kilometers or 1.4 billion gigatons of water on the surface or within our planet. That is a pretty unfathomable number. But let's break that down just a little bit. So here we can look at uh, the, for example, the uh, distribution of fresh water to other water. So there's 2.5% fresh water on our planet. Uh, other saline water constitutes about 9 or 0.9%. Oceans constitute 96.5% of the total global water by volume. But let's break that down a little bit more. So now we're just going to look at the component that exists within that 2.5% of fresh water because that's what matters to us. Now, the oceans are, as things are evapotranspiring or evaporating off of the surface of the ocean, that's going into our atmosphere as well. But let's just kind of consider for a second, kind of the fresh water, the potable water that we as humans really use and care about. About 1.2% is surface water or other fresh water. Groundwater constitutes another 30.1%. Glaciers and ice caps constitute 68.7%. That Glaciers and ice caps, that is frozen water, right? Snow or ice that has fallen and formed on the land. Groundwater, that's water that has moved through and uh, into the water table below our feet. And then surface or other water, that's water that's either in the atmosphere or running off of the landscape in some way, shape, or form. So now we're going to look at that 1.2%. So of that 1.2%, 3% is contained within our atmosphere at any given time more or less. Uh, and that's the water that if I'm looking out right now, it's a completely overcast day here in Eau Claire. Uh, it's mid-February, unseasonably warm uh, and quite moist out uh, in these last few days and weeks. So we're looking at cloud cover. That's all atmospheric moisture. And that's water is locked up in the clouds. So that constitutes that 3%. Now, it's not always locked up in in Clouds, moisture is throughout the atmosphere in variable components, depending on where you're at. Um, but that's how we could consider atmospheric moisture. 
uh, about two point or about 0.26 or a quarter of a percent is locked up in things like you and I and plants and, and uh, animals and trees and all those types of things. Uh, 0.49% is locked up in rivers or flowing through rivers. Uh, 2.6 in swamps or marshes. 3.8 is locked to the grains of soil, uh, sand, silts, and clays underneath our feet. About 20.9% in lakes. And then 69% in ground ice and permafrost. So if we were to look at it, just kind of break it down here, we care about a lot of this water because all of this water, or at least a, a, a large majority of the surface water on our planet is from the oceans. 96.5% is available available water in, in that regard to atmospheric processes. Things are melting or evaporating off the oceans. In fact, this kind of big cycle is something we call the hydrologic cycle or the water cycle, right? You probably learned about this in sixth grade or seventh grade. Here, we're looking at things like water evaporating off the oceans, condensing into the clouds, precipitating over the land or over the oceans, running off from the surface back into lakes, ponds, oceans, or moving through as groundwater flow. Now we can come up with a simple budget for this. We kind of look at this figure here and consider average annual transfers of water in thousand cubic kilometers. If we look over our oceans, about 413,000 cubic kilometers are evaporated in a given year. Over land, that's only about 73%. Of course, that water condenses, precipitation occurs. Over oceans, we've got 373 units, or 373,000 cubic kilometers, raining back onto the surface of the ocean. Not even getting to the land, just raining back on water. Uh, over... The, our land masses, about 113. Now, if you look at that, that doesn't necessarily add up. 113 minus 73, that's 40. 40 or 413 minus 373, that's 40 as well. So one is a loss of 40, the other is a gain of 40. Well, if you look at the exchange of water from our oceans to our land, we can consider about 40,000 cubic kilometers uh, moving from you know, ocean or oceanic regions over uh, back onto our land masses. And then you can consider groundwater flow constituting about one of those thousand cubic kilometers that's flowing back out into the ocean. And then stream flow, about 39,000 uh, cubic kilometers of stream flow going back into the oceans, also 40. So here we're looking at this big budget of how water moves about our planet, condenses, precipitates, falls out. And those are intimately linked with the processes of meteorology that we're concerned with and considering here in our class. So that's going to make it uh, recap this video here. Water is a chemical compound. The forces of cohesion, adhesion, and capillary forces are incredibly important because they kind of dictate how water moves through the soil, through trees, is available for things like evapotranspiration, uh, etc. It's a chemical catalyst. It's really good at breaking things down. Not necessarily super important here in this class, but as a force, as a you know, force of power, a force of nature, water being able to break things down and move them through rainfall and snow melt and all those types of things is incredibly important to us as humans. It exists in all phases of matter, solid liquids and gases. Latent and specific heat are incredibly important. It exchanges heat with phase change or latent heat. And then with specific heat, it takes more water or more energy to heat water up uh, and longer time for it to cool down. So it provides a moderating effect for our coastal climates and coastal communities. And we talked about the water cycle at the end, just kind of how water functions and moves and is budgeted across our planet. In the next few videos, we're going to be talking about uh, things like humidity and air masses. So stay tuned and we'll see you in the next video. I hope you have a great day. Thanks.